So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paulina, and this summer, as uh, Dr. Conway said, I was working with Dr. Usprich on communicating science to senior learners. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when I talk about seniors, uh, we defined it as those 55 years and older. So we'll be referring to this definition throughout this presentation as well. So communicating science to seniors or teaching science to seniors is not a new concept. Learning for seniors has been shown to be beneficial for their health, uh, their cognitive function, has been shown to improve their quality of life. And, uh, but coming back to teaching seniors, um, this is not new. So across BC, we actually have elder college. These elder colleges just all across the province and on an international level, we have the University of the Third Age, which is the most longstanding uh, life learning institution but when we look at the science programming offered by U3A, we're seeing a lot of science of cooking, science of gardening, but for the most part, we're not seeing a lot of specialized science programs being offered. And that being said, um, next slide please. This project was aimed to fill this gap to develop a specialized science program, in this case, a cell biology program, that is tailored to senior learners, as well as to create an outreach demonstration. And this was all done with the bigger goal of improving public trust in science among this demographic in light of COVID-19. And this goal goes way beyond our project because as we all know now, seniors have been found to be a high risk group for contracting COVID-19 and developing health complications. But we also know that following the uh, restrictions on in-person programming and in-person meetings, um, we saw a spread of misinformation by anti-mask and, and anti-vaccine groups, both online and in person through protests. So keeping this information in mind, it really shows the importance of uh, uh, maintaining the seniors trust given how vulnerable of a demographic they are and next slide please that being said this project uh, consisted of us creating three lesson plans administering three zoom sessions and distributing two qualtrics surveys on the left you see the poster that was created for the program for online promotion we contacted facilities the senior care centers however the two Two big barriers were um, there's not enough technology or two uh, that there's not enough technological knowledge uh, for those residents but we were able to come up with a five-person cohort that stuck around through the three sessions and on the right hand side you see the distribution of age ranges in that cohort so we see some people in the 60s to 65 year old range some of the 65 to 70 year old and and some from uh, 80 and 85 year old range. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And uh, looking at this broadly from the two surveys, one which was uh, administered after the first session and the other which was administered after the last session, we see a general positive trend, a general increase in the seniors' knowledge of cell biology as well as their trust in scientists and trust in doctors. This is great news because it shows that it is possible to improve their uh, level of trust in science. And in the end, it does demonstrate the necessity to continue supporting such programs. And uh, next slide, please. As I said, it is important to continue working on such projects like this one, the cell biology program, and seeing what it can do next. And uh, I, will, I will link uh, this below but all the visual artifacts that were created for this project the lesson plans the slideshows the surveys all of those have been put onto a handcrafted website and I will link it below if any of you would like to look at it so thank you for having me thank you Paulina yeah you could put that into the um, chat actually if you want 
Okay. So do we have any, um, any questions for Polina? Where's my chat message? Well, I have, my only complaint is that you have seniors as, as 55. Not sure where that name, number came from. <laughs> um, so Polina, where, how, where did you, um, where are these patients, or not patients, where does this population come from? Like, how did you identify the people? So since we called um, different facilities, but we're unable to get them to join the program, we decided to go the online route and look to the online space. So we looked at Facebook as a source of participants. So we contacted some senior groups like Fraser Health Seniors, 411 Seniors, Health and Informed, just a bunch of different groups. And uh, we're able to gather, uh, one person came from the 411 Seniors and others came from just a range of different um, Facebook groups. Cool. So Ed Price had a question. Was there a common theme of deficient knowledge with respect to, say, COVID? I would say so. Um, there was definitely, um, we had discussions. That was something that we implemented into the lessons. We had discussion breaks that allowed um, the, all of these participants to give feedback on what this this content made them think about, what this reminded them of. And a lot of them mentioned vaccines and their hesitance about the current state of everything with COVID. And after our third lesson, actually, when we were talking about insulin vaccines, and I just was talking about uh, Frederick Banting and how he was uh, involved in creating the, the uh, developing insulin, they definitely were, talking about how this made them, I guess, uh, think differently about the role of vaccines because most of them um, have heard too much about the dangers and uh, uh, all that misinformation spread by the anti-vaccine groups. So yes, to answer your question, Ed, there's definitely a theme of deficient knowledge um, with respect to COVID-19. Cool. Any other questions or comments? It's really an interesting project. Great. Okay, Polina, thank you very much. All right. We'll um, move on to the next speakers, uh, Maureen uh, Tourette, um, who's from the lab of Dr. Fabio Rossi. Maureen, are you around? Yes, I'm here. Good. Okay, good. Hold on. And then I have to get you going here. Share this. You have to be patient with me because I am a senior, you know. <laughs> okay. Great. Yes. yes. Um, thank you uh, for accepting my abstract. And today I will talk about my project, uh, which is the role of TGF beta activated kinase 1 in adult MSC a chemodulator of the inflammatory environment. So on the next slide, um, what we know about adult mesenchymal stromal cells is that they have an important function toward immune cells. And this is mainly based on study uh, in the bone marrow, but this is the case in other tissue. And so those cells will secrete tons of cytokine, um, growth factor and chemokine that will modulate the inflammation. But we currently don't know what are the signaling pathways involved in the regulation of the inflammatory function of those cells. In the meantime, on the right, it has been described that TAC1, so TG beta activated kinase 1, has an important function in immune cells. And most of the time, when this kinase is removed from B cells, T cells of macrophages, those cells go under apoptosis. But in some cases, such as in MEFs, the lesion of TAC1 will induce a slight activation of the cells and they will turn on some innate uh, signaling. So we were wondering if TAC1 can be involved in MSC in the regulation of this immune function. So on the next slide, I will, um, re um, it would be a bit of everything that's what's happening in this mouse. And so when we remove TAC1 in MSC using HIC1, 
HECON stands for uh, HECON CRE, so HECON stands for high permeating cancer one, and it's expressed in quiescent mesenchymal stromal cells. When TAC1 is removed from those cells, we see a huge uh, increase in many cytokines in the blood of uh, the mice, such as IL-4, IL-13, IL-5, CCL-11, and IL-15. And also we see an increase in IgE. And what we think is happening is that somehow the deletion of TAC1 in MSC will induce type 2 innate lymphoid cells to circulate in the blood. Because those cells are a high source of IL-4 and IL-13, um, T cells will be activated, B cells uh, also, and they will start to um, express and secrete IgE. Altogether with the IL-5 uh, overexpression, eosinophil will survive and will activate. In the meantime, it has been shown that IL-4 and IL-13 was inducing MSC to secrete CCL11, and this was uh, shown in the adipose tissue. And in return, we will see an increase in eosinophil circulation in the blood and in various tissue. So those mice display a huge type 2 inflammation at the systemic level. And we were wondering what are the consequences of this type 2 inflammation in type 1 and type 2 inflammatory disease. So on the next slide, uh, the first uh, model that we used was an allergic response. And for this, we injected the papain in internally in the in TAC1 control and TAC1 knockout mouse. And what you can see on the histology of those lung is that TAC1 knockout mice it, um, has, have a worse than histology, a histopathology of the lung. Indeed, you can see much more inflammation and uh, infiltration also uh, with um, an enlargement of the blood vessels. And this has for consequence a decrease in the function of the lung as the, um, their capacity is decreased with the graph top right. And this is associated with a decrease in the dynamic compliance and in, uh, with an increase of dynamic elastance. So these results show that TAC1 knockout lung actually lose their capacity because they are more stiff. And this is due to the inflammation and not to fibrosis. On the next slide, we also induce a type 1 model, the type 1 disease, which uh, kind of mimic the multiple sclerosis. And for doing that, we used the experimental autoimmune encephaloid, encephalomyeloitis model, sorry, or EA. In this model, type 1 immune cells will attack the CNS and induce myelin damage. This has for consequence um, him blind paralysis, as you can see on the video, one mouse is uh, paralyzed while the other one is still running around. And actually what we see in this, is, in this model is that while TAC1, uh, the control mice in black, drastic, drastically and rapidly lose weight and display symptoms as shown on the video, the TAC1 knockout seems to be protected, or at least they will delay the operation of um, the symptoms. So altogether, and on the next slide, I wanted to point out that um, we always show type 1 and type 2 uh, these, uh, immune cells as uh, ab in a balance. But what's important here is that there is also the mesenchymal stromal cells that play an important role in the regulation of this inflammation. And TAC1 actually play an important role in both type of cells, so the immune cells and the mesenchymal stromal cells. And uh, it's important to regulate this kinase uh, and this signaling pathway in both type of cell to uh, be able to um, regulate the inflammatory environment. Thank you for listening to me. Great. Okay. So we're open up for questions. I'll ask Tak. Um, are there any mutations associated with um, in, in human disease? I'm not really sure. So this project was started with a totally other goal. And then we found all this inflammation phenotype that we were not expecting. So it's kind of a new axe of my main project. So I didn't really look into that. Okay. There are many other... Um... Comments and rescue studies. Are there uh, have rescue studies been done on these mice? The, the mean, trying to remove the type two inflammation. So um, I crossed those mice um, 
with the ST2 knockout, which is the receptor for IL-33 that activate IL-C2. Uh, so I just start crossing the mice with those um, uh, ST2 knockout. So I don't have the result yet. We are also crossing those mice with RAG1 knockout that are missing T cells and B cells. And I also cross these mice with the NHG model. So I start all those crossing to be able to see what cells induce really this type two inflammation. And I hope I can give an answer in the next few months. Um, Ed asks, can we use siRNA to downregulate TAC1 in autoimmunity? So I don't know in autoimmunity, but it has been done most of the time in vitro in macrophages, for example, uh, and it always induced death of immune cells. Uh, so it will always induce a reduction of the inflammation. But it has been shown in some study that deletion of TAC1 in hepatocyte was actually inducing more inflammation. So we really need to be careful here. And in vivo, I'm not sure how ICRNA can um, work because we have to take in consideration both the immune cells that will be downregulated and the mesenchymal stoma cell that will be upregulated. So I don't really know how this balance will work. All right, great. No other questions? Great, thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Keiko Patterson from the lab of Christian Castro. Keiko, are you there? Hello, yes I am. Are you there? Oh, there you go. Okay. Hi. Hello. All right, oh. oh, sickles. Oh, you're good to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Keiko Patterson, and I am a second year medical student at UBC. Uh, today, I'm happy to be presenting on behalf of our Nepal sickle cell team. As a background, we're a group of medical students from UBC who've been traveling to the rural province of Dang in Nepal since 2015 to assist in the screening, diagnosis, and education of patients with sickle cell disease. As a background on sickle cell disease, sickle cell disease is a genetically inherited autosomal recessive blood condition resulting in atypical sickle hemoglobin. It is associated with serious complications, including debilitating chronic pain, infection, death, and more. Early diagnosis is the key to improving prognosis and quality of life. Since 2015, we have worked in partnership with a local NGO called Creating Possibilities, as well as her international. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this is just a quick project overview. So this year, due to COVID-19 travel restrictions, we decided to create a five-year project summary to look at how we have progressed with our initial objectives. So looking at the timeline, the first case of sickle cell disease in Nepal was actually only formally reported in 2003. And since that time, many more recent reports suggested a large and outstanding burden, especially amongst the underserved indigenous population known as the Tharu people. Now, historically, being a sickle cell carrier was an evolutionary advantage as it holds protective properties against malaria. It wasn't until 2014 that sickle cell disease was even officially recognized as a public health problem. Now, in 2015, our first group of medical students set out to estimate the prevalence of sickle cell disease amongst this Tharu population. In 2016 and 2017, we focused um, our energy more towards a needs assessment, and we were trying to identify current knowledge gaps of learning in sickle cell disease, as well as barriers to accessing healthcare. Um, using the knowledge from those barriers, we then did focus our time in 2018 and 2019 on creating um, a sustainable model for education that could be carried out by our local partner and community health workers. Uh, next slide, please, Ed. And so these are our project objectives. Number one, characterize the prevalence of sickle cell disease among the Thario population in Dang. Uh, click again. Number two, understand factors that impede access to diagnosis and care. And three, implement a sustainable solution for long-term detection and management of sickle cell disease patients. Next slide, please. So looking at our work in 2015, 
So in 2015, alongside creating possibilities, our team screened 2,899 individuals in the thyroid population for sickle cell disease. An estimated prevalence of the sickle cell trait in the population was found to be 9.3%. Now, if we look over to the diagram on the right, it shows the global prevalence in comparison to Nepal, and it demonstrates the high burden in this population and need for a long-term detection and management program. Um, our findings were published in the journal Hemoglobin in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. And our next objective was looking at um, identifying barriers for healthcare intervention for those with sickle cell disease. So this kind of goes into our objectives surrounding a needs assessment to build our future directions. So in 2016 and 2017, we conducted qualitative interviews with patients who had previously been screened positive, as well as just focus groups amongst community members and community health workers. There were three main themes that were identified from these interviews. So number one was an inadequate local resources, two is financial burdens of care, and number three was the need for healthcare um, education. Next slide, please. Now this takes us to our final and er, for us right now, our most important objective, and that's surrounding capacity building. And our goal is to implement a sustainable solution for long-term detection and management of sickle cell disease patients. So this year, what we really did is we've looked over what we've done and where we need to go. Um, so in terms of screening and diagnosis, after estimating the prevalence in 2015 um, for the sickle cell trait, uh, there is now actually ongoing screening that's being done from six local health posts, and this is all done autonomously by community health workers. Um, as well, since the initiation of our project, we're seeing more people receiving diagnostic testing for those who have screened positive. So this is something that is ongoing and we're always working to improve. And, and then the second one was identifying barriers to healthcare intervention so that we could create what a sustainable solution would look like for this community. Um, and again, the needs assessment was done in 2016, 2017. And something that we're planning to do this year is virtually conduct um, interviews with patients who have um, previously been fully diagnosed with sickle cell disease. Um, and then that the next part is education on sickle cell disease. And this is uh, something that the 2018 and 2019 groups really focus on. And so they revised our, in, um, our initial educational modules and then went on to train the community health workers. Uh, in 2019, we did um, some quantitative analysis through questionnaires looking at were these modules effective and is this something that um, would lead to a sustainable education and awareness program. And currently, uh, the community health workers now carry out uh, mothers groups educational sessions. Now, this year, um, the two main things that we've identified is one is advocating for political support. So another barrier that was identified was financial burdens of care. Currently, there's only a thousand dollars equivalent US um, that's given to someone who's diagnosed with sickle cell disease for their entire lifetime. Um, and as one patient mentioned who we interviewed, that may only last someone for around six years. So that's definitely one avenue is to continue talking with local health authorities. Um, and then our other focus is to hopefully long term help them to implement a universal newborn screening program. Uh, so now in 2015, our screening only consisted of those who are six months of age and older when we are very aware that there's a high mortality uh, for, the, for children under five due to infection and a lot of other complications. Um, this year, our literature review focused on looking at other ongoing newborn screening programs that are, help, that are currently ongoing in other similar resource limited settings. Um, and that's it for now. Thank you so much for listening. That was fabulous. Thank you. So I, I misintroduced you. You don't work with Christian Castro, obviously. So, um, but um, tell just tell us a little bit about you and what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. In relation to this project. Well, and then uh, what, what programs are you in? What program? Okay, of course. Um, hi everyone. My name's Keiko. I'm a second year medical student at UBC. A little bit about myself is. I traveled to Nepal for four months prior to going into medicine and I had a great opportunity of just uh, shadowing some different medical oncologists at a hospital in Kathmandu. And I think that's what got me initially interested in global health. Um, and then starting last year, I heard about this um, project 
and I reached out to the previous team and I'm very happy to be working on it now. Um, an update with our team is, unfortunately, of course, we were unable to travel this year and we're unsure about next year as well. So I think we're really looking for input from whoever about what can we do uh, remotely to still help this project move forward. Um, and if, you know, connecting with different hematologists or anyone who may have recommendations for, you know, where can we even begin our literature search for uh, like a neonatal screening program or um, whatever that may be. That's great. There will be lots of, um, of developing countries in the same boat um, who have sickle cell programs that are, that are searching for the same types of solutions and overcoming these challenges. So it's, it's not unique. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, are there any questions or comments? Okay, Cheryl, um, oh, we've got a couple of questions. Um, what does sickle cell look like in someone who lives at high altitudes and what sort of supports does a thousand dollars go towards? Great, thank you for the questions. Um, okay, so I'll answer the first one first. So sickle cell, so essentially, as I mentioned, it's an autosomal recessive disorder. And when the blood cell is deoxygenated, it comes and it has a more sickle cell-like appearance. This is what ends up creating a lot of the complications, um, makes them more prone to infection because there's splenic sequestration and uh, chronic pain from in the, in the joints as well. Um, in terms of at a high altitude, so the thyroid population actually lives in the Terai region, so it's more lowland, but of course, Nepal itself is high. Um, and I could just imagine that probably the difficulties um, you know, surrounding oxygen saturation and everything would likely be potentially heightened from being at a higher altitude. Um, great question for number two. So what sort of supports would $1,000 go to? We tried to break that down this year. I can send over our project summary as well if anyone's interested. Um, that goes through hydroxyurea. That's currently um, the medication that they're using um, as well as any like pain relief, other pain relief medications. Uh, as well as right now to receive the hydroxyurea, you may not live close to a local health post or you might have to travel to the closest hospital, which for some, especially those who are living higher up, it can be a full day trek. And so a lot of that money is goes towards the money that's also lost from that. Um, but there's a lot of challenges of even accessing the money itself, as well as you have to be, you have to get your medication or I think most of your medical services from a specific hospital. And so if you're not signed up to a different one, then you may have to pay out of pocket. And that's a, a, a big other focus that we're trying to look at with the NGO and Dang is how can we make that money more accessible? Uh, do you know, uh, Tico, do you know if these um, patients in Nepal have high hemoglobin F? Great question. I honestly, I'm not sure, um, but that's definitely something to look into. That would be very interesting. Anybody else? No, okay, great. Carol, um, Nico, thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks to all the trainees for fabulous presentations today. And we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, our next speaker on the list. Oh, okay. Oh, Martin, you're doing it from yourself. Oh, great. Okay, love that. All right, Dr. Martin Schreiber is a professor of surgery and trauma, critical care, and acute care surgery at Oregon Health uh, and Science University. He's on the American College of Surgeons Board of Governors, and he is the chair of the Adv advocacy pillar. He's been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan and has searched, served as the Joint Theater Trauma System Director. Dr. Schreiber is also the director of the Trauma Research Lab, the Army Civilian Trauma Training Team, and the Donald T. D. Trunke Center for Civilian and Combat Casualty Care at OHSU. Lab research interests include resuscitation of hemorrhagic shock, hemorrhage control, and the development of novel blood products. His lab is engaged in over 40 investigational protocols. He's considered a leader in the trauma community, has been an invited speaker throughout the world, and we're really happy to have him here today. Martin, you're on. 
Are you there? Oh, but without sound. Demute. Well, you're still muted. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Uh, really nice introduction. And and uh, welcome to you all from Portland, Oregon, where we're experiencing new uh, near apocalyptic conditions. We're having high winds, fires, smoke, plagues, and riots. Well, you got Other than that, everything is good. Okay, stay south of the border, would you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a trauma surgeon. I'm going to change the direction of the meeting here for a little while. And I'm going to talk about adjuncts to massive transfusion. Uh, in our types of patients. And by the way, uh, with COVID-19 in the United States, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in violence uh, and penetrating trauma. For disclosures, uh, I'm a consultant for hemonetics. I'll be talking about the use of TEG to guide adjunctive therapy. I'm funded by CSL Bearing to do research involving uh, prothrombin complex concentrate. Uh, we're doing a pre-hospital trial. And the, uh, research, my research on TXA was funded by the Department of Defense, actually both uh, in the United States and Canada. So I'm gonna be talking about adjuncts to either whole blood or a balanced resuscitation of one to one to one plasma to platelets to red cells. And some of the things I'll be talking about will include prothrombin complex concentrate, fibrinogen concentrate, uh, and uh, tranexamic acid. So the goal of resuscitation in massively bleeding patients is to correct the physiology and abnormalities that, that are experienced by those patients. Uh, this is known as damage control resuscitation. So what are the abnormal pathophysiologies that uh, bleeding patients experience? Well, first, there's the acute traumatic coagulopathy, the combination of severe tissue injury and tissue hypoperfusion result in a coagulopathic state that's mediated through activated protein C. This can be measured minutes after injury uh, in patients in the field, and with uh, EMS drawing blood, you can see uh, a coagulopathy within minutes. Frequently, patients in the field are resuscitated with high chloride-containing acidotic room temperature uh, crystalloid solutions these produce an acidosis, hemodilute coagulation factors, and cause hypothermia. A number of very significant pathophysiologies then occur, which include an intense inflammatory response, which results in SIRS and frequently acute respiratory distress syndrome, as well as ARDS. We also see hyperfibrinolysis, endothelial dysfunction uh, with leaky capillaries, which exacerbate brain injury as well as organ failure, dysfunctional fibrinogen, and platelet function. Interestingly, if you were to look at one potential therapy that would treat all of these things, it would be fresh whole blood, uh, which is unfortunately not available uh, in the civilian setting. However, all of this contributes to ongoing uncontrolled hemorrhage. So balanced resuscitation is defined as a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one balance between plasma, platelets, and red cells. This, uh, these are the results of the proper trial. This was a randomized trial performed in multiple centers in the United States where patients were randomized to a ratio of one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one or one-to-one-to-two plasma to platelets to red cells, uh, and these were severely bleeding patients. The data are quite interesting. What you see here is that three hours, the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one group actually has a statistically increased rate of survival. However, by 24 hours and 28 days, there was no longer statistically significant differences, but there were equal deaths in each group, which kind of diluted out the early benefit of the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one resuscitation. Now, uh, having said that, the one to one to one versus one to one to two resuscitation was only done until bleeding was stopped, which occurred around three hours. The way this was done was by bringing boxes of blood containing the correct ratios, so the correct ratio was always given. And this resulted, this, this technique of placing the uh, balanced blood products in boxes has really helped us going forward in maintaining these high ratios in our massive transfusions. So, after a while, we started saying, okay, well, we're, we're recreating whole blood. 
why don't we just use whole blood? So this is a, a comparison of what you get if you do one to one to one, one unit of red cells, or six units of red cells, six, uh, one aphoris Rhesus units of platelets, six units of FFP, and a 10 pack, pack of cryo. Due to all the additive solutions that come in these bags, you actually get about a hematocrit of 29%, a platelet count of 87,000, 65% coagulation activity, and 750 milligrams of fibrinogen. If you compare that to a freshly obtained bag of fresh whole blood, you get a, a normal hematocrit, a normal platelet count, 100% coag activity, and 1,500 milligrams of fibrinogen. Unfortunately, this is only available in theater. In the civilian setting, we use liquid cold stored whole blood. And this is an example of a massive transfusion performed in my institution. This patient received 44 units of, of liquid cold stored whole blood, only one unit of crystalloid, and then platelets and plasma that were dictated by our thrombulastometry, which I'll talk about in uh, the way that we do this. So a very important aspect of our massive transfusion and probably the most important adjunct, speaking of adjuncts, is our massive transfusion protocol nurse. The massive transfusion nurse goes to all massive transfusions occurring in the operating room and does all the things that you see in this slide. First of all, they place the order for the massive transfusion, both to start it and stop it. Blood products are delivered from the blood bank and received by the nurse. They verify the blood products. Whole blood is administered when it's available. We have 20 units a week. And during this summer, we've been running out of it. If it's, if it's not available, we give one to one to one. The, the, the nurse manages the rapid infuser and we use a Belmont. They track what product has been given and communicates that with the trauma team. They ensure the patient has received calcium gluconate uh, after the first four hours, after the first units, four units of blood products are given. They then draw labs every 30 minutes, including a calcium and a tag. And then calcium is given as needed and adjuncts are given to replace coagulation products based on the tag. TXA is given to our massive transfusion patients if they are within three hours of injury, and then the nurse makes sure that additional labs are ordered. So this is our protocol for uh, adjunctive therapies in a massive transfusion. Again, these are tags that are done every 30 minutes. These are rapid tags if the, act, if the uh, activated clotting time is greater than 128 seconds, two units of FFP are given. If the, uh, if the angle is less than 65 degrees, 10 units of cryo are given. If the MA or maximum amplitude is less than 55, a unit of platelets are given. And if the LY30 is elevated, tranexamic acid is given. So we have this algorithm. This is done throughout the massive transfusion and managed by our massive transfusion nurse. This is a typical Portland patient, a cirrhotic motorcyclist who just had an MI, who has stents in place, it's on Plavix. Uh, the patient ended up with a splenic injury we were in the operating room. We can watch these tags play out in the operating room. When we got to about here, we saw that the tag was going to be very thin, was going to have a low angle and a low MA. So we immediately gave uh, cryoprecipitate and, uh, uh, and platelets. And then 30 minutes later, we repeat the tag. The tag is normal. The, the spleen comes out and all the bleeding stops. So this is a, a, an example of how this can be done. It's very useful to be able to see the tag in the operating room so that you can respond immediately to abnormal uh, tags. So let's talk about some of the other potential adjuncts, prothrombin complex concentrate. Uh, Case Centra is available in the United States. Uh, it's a concentrate from human plasma. They'll tell you that it contains uh, 2, 7, 9, and 10 factors, 2, 7, 9, and 10, but it actually contains over 200 proteins, including protein CNS, antithrombin 3, and heparin. Uh, and in this manner, uh, PCC is relatively balanced with respect to clotting. It's approved for urgent reversal of Coumadin in bleeding patients requiring emergency surgery. The four-factor concentrate uh, dosed at 50 units per kilogram, which is the dose we use for patients on DOAGs, costs about uh, a little over $4,000 for a 70-kilogram person. Because of its short half-life, it's administered with vitamin K. It has in vitro effects uh, both on the direct thrombin inhibitors and on the 10A inhibitors, and we do use it uh, for, for those uh, products. 
So what are the advantages over FFP? It's rapidly available and for elderly patients with congestive heart failure uh, who are volume sensitive, it does not require a large volume transfusion like FFP does. It's decreased, it has a decreased infection risk due to multiple viral in inactivation steps, as well as a decreased risk of trolley. 3,000 international units will increase the factors by about 40 to 80 percent. Uh, PCC has been used for reversal of vitamin K antagonists and well published. I'll show you that data. It's been used for surgical procedures in hemophiliacs, cardiopulmonary bypass, massive bleeding, and in trauma patients who are not anticoagulating. So these are the results of the prospective randomized trial. Uh, you can see uh, here graphed out a comparison between patients who receive four factor. PCC and standard plasma resuscitation. And what you see here is if you look at the fraction of patients without INR correction, it's much lower very rapidly than the patients who receive the PCC. Same sh shown here in uh, graphically in B, you can see that there's much more rapid correction of coagulopathy based on the mean INR in the patients who receive PCC. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that we saw this, that, that this, uh, there was much more rapid correction of coagulopathy, there was no evidence in the study of decreased bleeding or improved outcomes. So PCC and trauma has been used. Uh, this is a, an analysis, a retrospective analysis of the Trauma Quality Improvement Project. Over two years, every trauma center reports their data to the TQIP. And that data can be used to study things like PCC use and trauma. And this, in this study, propensity score matching was used. In 486 patients, 243 received FFP alone, and 243 received both FFP and four-factor PCC. The results of the study show that in those patients who received PCC, there was reduction in the use of the number of red cells as well as the number of platelets that were utilized. There was no difference, however, in the number of platelets. And this was true both at four hours and at 24 hours. More importantly, if you look at overall in-hospital mortality, that was statistically significantly reduced in the PCC patients. Furthermore, patients who received PCC had a lower incidence of both of acute kidney injury, ARDS, uh, and no difference in thromboembolic complications. So this appears to be very effective. Again, this is a retrospective study, not a randomized study. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do plan to do a pre-hospital case-centric trial in trauma patients. This will be a double-blind randomized controlled trial. Blinded kits will be placed on EMS uh, ambulances in Portland, Seattle, and Houston. The study will be done with exception from informed consent, meaning uh, community consultation. Uh, and then once the patients are able to be consented, they will be consented. Our inclusion criteria are age greater than 18 and severe evidence of hypotension with a blood pressure less than 70 or absence of a radial pulse. In this trial, we're going to dose patients on sort of a visible uh, weight. Thin patients will get 2,000 units and uh, patients who appear to have an, uh, a high BMI will receive 3,000 units. Similar, another uh, TQIP study looking at cryoprecipitate use in trauma patients. Again, another two-year retrospective trial looking uh, at the TQIP data. You can see that when patients receive cryoprecipitate, the 24-hour mortality is statistically reduced, as is the in-hospital mortality with no difference in in-hospital complications. So cryoprecipitate also appears to be effective as an adjunct to a massive transfusion. So having said that, what about fibrinogen concentrate? Similar to PCC, fibrinogen concentrate is a localized powder stored at room temperature. It's rapidly constituted in water. And when reconstituted, the concentration is approximately one gram per 50 cc's, meaning that you get about a similar amount of uh, fibrinogen as you would uh, in cryo itself. There's also viral inactivation by pasteurization and different additional purification removing uh, both antigens and antibodies, decreasing the risk of allergic reactions. Fibrinogen concentrate has been widely used around the world, not so much in North America, but has been used in trauma, cardiothoracic surgery, obstetric hemorrhage, orthopedics, excessive bleeding in urologic cases, uh, and in thrombocytopenic patients uh, with increased, uh, showing increased platelet aggregation and density of the fibrin network. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit as a, as a, as a different way to resuscitate coagulopathic trauma patients. This is a, a study that I'll show you uh, by uh, uh, Schockel from Austria, where as opposed to using blood products to correct coagulopathy, concentrates are utilized. Uh, and the first utilized uh, concentrate is fibrinogen and then PCC. The replacement protocol is based on, in this case, a Rotem. And if the Rotem is, is abnormal, based on the personalized Rotem, either fibrinogen concentrate or PCC is given. So this is the replacement protocol for the, if the maximum clot firmness is, firmness is abnormal, uh, fibrinogen is given. If the maximum clot firmness fails to respond, then platelets are given. For patients on Coumadin with an increased clotting time, uh, PCC is given. And in this study, they targeted a hemoglobin of 10 grams per deciliter. So these are the results of the trial. These are consecutive trauma patients, 128 consecutive trauma patients. And you can see here what was given to these patients. The vast majority of these patients, based on the Rotem, received fibrinogen concentrate. About two thirds of the patients received PCC. And what you notice here is very small numbers of patients actually got standard blood products to include FFP, prothrombin, uh, PCC, or uh, uh, and actually quite a few got RBCs, but much less use of standard blood products whereas much greater use of the concentrates. So this was not a randomized trial, but what they noticed was that the observed mortality was, was much less uh, than the expected mortality based on the TRIS scoring. Uh, so much less predicted uh, observed mortality than predicted. So seemingly hopeful that this may be a good way to resuscitate patients. So what about tranexamic acid? Tranexamic acid's uh, already been mentioned today. Uh, this drug has decades of uh, experience, very long history of use in elective surgery, typically given as a one gram bolus followed by a one gram infusion over eight hours. There, this is a Cochrane database systematic review of the use of TXA versus a placebo. It includes 53 studies, 29 cardiac surgery, 21 orthopedics, some liver surgery, vascular surgery, almost 4,000 patients, and what the Cochrane analysis shows is that the relative risk of needing a blood transfusion is statistically lower with tranexamic acid. In, these, in this elective surgery study, there was no difference in death, thromboembolic events, MI, or stroke. And I just want to point out that the dosing of tranexamic acid, one gram bolus followed by one gram infusion, was really based on elective surgery, not trauma. This was the CRASH-2 trial, an amazing trial. Uh, performed in 274 hospitals in 40 countries, 20,000 patients studied, and randomized to receive either tranexamic acid or a placebo. Uh, uh, 20,000 patients were randomized, 20,000 patients were followed up, and you can see that this study was done all over the world, uh, except for the United States, and actually Canada withdrew before enrolling any patients, so not done in North America, but really all over the world, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Africa, South America, truly, truly amazing 20,000 patient study. The bottom line of this study was that there was a statistically significant reduction in mortality in patients who were given tranexamic acid by about 1.5%. Interesting, when you looked at the cause of death in the trial, the greatest difference in death was noted uh, in bleeding patients uh, as expected However, there were other signals, particularly in the area of organ failure and head injury. The subset of these head injury patients, severely injured patients, actually had a signal with it, uh, improved outcomes. However, death from any uh, source was statistically reduced in this study. So I wanna tell you about our recent uh, traumatic brain injury study. It was actually published in JAMA yesterday. This was a ROC trial, Resuscitation Outcome uh, Consortium trial. The ROC uh, has ended. But, this, uh, but the ROC uh, went on for over a decade. And you can see the sites that participated in the ROC, including uh, two sites in British Columbia, as well as Toronto, uh, and then uh, throughout uh, North America. For this particular trial, which was a trial in traumatic brain injury, patients with a GCS of three to 12, moderate to se severe traumatic brain injury, there were 12 sites, 20 hospitals participated, and 39 EMS agencies, again, throughout North America. 
these uh, these uh, EMS trucks carried blinded kits that either contained two grams of TXA, one gram of TXA, and placebo. The group that randomized to one gram of TXA in the field received a one gram infusion over eight hours in the hospital, as was uh, typically done for dosing. Our inclusion criteria included blunt or penetrating trauma, moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. We excluded hypotensive patients and we included adults with an IV being transported to a participating hospital. We excluded patients who, with a GCS of three with no reactive pupil who were greater than two hours out from injury who got CPI, CPR, seizures or strokes or dialysis uh, or burns. Interestingly, when you looked at our three groups, this is the placebo group, the bolus maintenance group, that's a one gram uh, bolus followed by a one gram maintenance dose versus bolus only. And when you look at the tag values, despite patients in the bolus only group receiving a two gram bolus of TXA, there was no difference in any tag parameter uh, compared to placebo or bolus maintenance. And importantly, when we looked at LY30, the amount of lysis, again, TXA being an antifibrinolytic, there was no difference in lysis. So this is very interesting and suggests that TXA may be working through a different mechanism than as an antifibrinolytic. Bottom line is when we looked at survival, the two gram only group had a statistically improved survival with almost all the difference in the first 10 hours. The bolus maintenance group or the one gram one group had no benefit over placebo. So this is a very important finding which I think is gonna result in TXA being carried pre-hospital uh, throughout uh, North America and perhaps the rest of the world. And the question becomes, will this also be effective for hemorrhagic shock and not only for traumatic brain injury? Lastly, I just wanna briefly talk about cold platelets. Uh, as you all know, uh, platelets are typically stored warm. Uh, they're kept in an agitator and are only good for five days with the greatest risk being the development of infection. Uh, the idea of cold platelets is attractive because cold platelets can be stored lower. The reason why platelets were currently stored at 22 degrees Celsius is because warmer platelets will stay, uh, uh, will stay in vivo for much longer than cold platelets. And this is because warm platelets are essentially not activated and, and uh, really float around not doing too much. Warm platelets, uh, cold platelets will survive uh, in vivo for about 1.3 days. And if you're talking about a trauma patient, that's more than enough to stop the bleeding. Again, most of the bleeding will, uh, will be stopped within three hours. So platelets that are surviving 1.3 days is, is quite good. When you look at platelet function, comparing cold platelets to warm platelets, what you see no matter how you measure it is that the cold platelets have much better function than the warm platelets. And I think this is really important, much greater function with cold plates. The US military has fielded cold platelets in theater for this reason, because they can be stored longer. And what this would do for us in, uh, in uh, North America would be allow us to have platelets in our smaller, uh, more rural hospitals that don't currently have platelets. So in conclusion, uh, the massive transfusion protocol is complex and multifaceted and I believe requires a single individual to focus entirely on the massive transfusion. In our case, that is a, uh, a, a massive transfusion nurse. One to one to one or liquid cold store whole blood is not enough and does require additional adjunctive therapy on top of it. The use of TXA in bleeding is evolving as is the use of concentrates. And some believe that we'll be eventually going to all concentrate uh, related uh, resuscitation for correction of coagulopathy. One thing that we don't know very well is how to give calcium. We know it's critical, but we don't know how and when to give it. And that's something that really needs to be figured out over time. And we know finally that cold platelets are better than warm platelets. And I think we're going to see a transition to using cold platelets in the future. That's all I have. I would be uh, uh, very happy to answer any questions. That was fabulous, Martin. Thank you very much. So do we have questions? I know we have lots of um, people working in these fields. Um, question, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if you had any personal experience with the three hour window with, for uh, tranexamic acid administration and if you can discuss why you think this is the case. 
So that is a fabulous question. Uh, the answer to the question is that every single study that has ever been done looking at tranexamic acid clearly shows that the earlier you give the drug, the better the benefit is. And uh, as is mentioned, at three hours, you now see, you cross over to increased mortality. I think, uh, and that by the way is why we're giving it, why we gave it pre-hospital in our trial. I think that tranexamic acid is working through a different mechanism. And I actually think that what it's doing is it's affecting uh, the permeability, the endothelial permeability uh, that's occurring. And I think that this is particularly important in brain injury where cerebral edema is frequently the cause of death. And I think that when you reach after three hours, you're going to lose the benefit of correcting permeability because again, that's the critical period. That first three hours is the critical period where bleeding either stops or the patient dies. So I do think that three hours has makes sense because of the fact uh, that that's when the critical period of bleeding occurs. But, but uh, whether or not I'm right about that, I'm not 100% sure, but what I will tell you with great certainty, the earlier you give the drug, the better patients do, and that's why I believe it should be on ambulances. I got a bunch more questions here, Martin. Okay, so thank you for your help from Wayne Zhao. Uh, Wayne is in Dana's group. Is there any strategy that can help patients who are in hypothermia? Yes. So number one, don't let it happen. That's the most. <laughs> so so I have. I mean, I, I'm I'm serious. So uh, so I have to tell you, over the course of my career, which has been a pretty long one the frequency with which I see hypothermia has dramatically decreased. So how do you avoid it? Well, number one, you've got to keep the patient warm uh, from the beginning. Number two, the fastest way to make a patient cold is to give them room temperature fluids. So over the course of the care of trauma patients in North America, we've stopped giving fluids in the field. And that's why our patients are no longer hypothermic. And then on top of that, Every fluid that we do give, all of the blood products that we do give, we give through rapid infusing warmers that warm the blood to temperatures around 39 degrees Celsius. So avoid hypothermia, do not give room temperature fluids and everything that you do give, give it warm because that's the fastest way to make a patient cold. Kristen, you wanna jump in? Kristen Castro? Sure, thanks. Um, I had a, um, actually I had a similar question uh, related to the mechanism of, of a TXA, but uh, maybe 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 I'll go a little bit further with the question. Do, do, you, do you still think it's through a um, uh, inhibition of a, a plasmin, or or is there something else happening? You know, um, I, you know, to me that's the that's the mystery question. Um, how could it be that we could randomize patients to two grams of TXA, one gram or placebo, and not see any difference in lysis? Uh, and brain injury patients who have a lot of lysis. So that, you know, that puts a big question on it for me. Um, however, uh, one of the issues that I'm having a problem with is the fact that we believe again that TXA is affecting uh, the endothelial permeability and that is supposed to be through a plasmin mechanism as well. Plasmin increases endothelial permeability and so, uh, so it's, it's a question I think is really unanswered. Uh, I will tell you that in our trial, we, got, we had CT scans on all of our patients, and we did not see difference in bleeding in those CT scans. Now, having said all of that, again, I showed you the elective surgery data that clearly showed a reduction in blood loss. So I think in my heart of hearts, I do think there is an effect, uh, an antifibrinolytic effect, effect uh, with the prevention of plasma production, but I don't know if it's as prominent as we've always said. And I think these other mechanisms, endothelial permeability among them, is playing a role. Um, we have a question. Um, do you know of any evidence for or against using DDAVP to increase platelet activity in trauma? Yes, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of data. I think that people uh, do use it. Uh, I don't think the quality of the data is enough to make a recommendation. Uh, you know, historically, it's been used uh, probably with benefit. I think that if you're in a situation and that's all you have, I would give it. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's not well studied in the trauma literature. In fact, everything having to do with antiplatelet agents and the use of platelets in the trauma literature is actually very poor. And uh, there's actually data that suggests that if you have patients on antiplatelet agents with brain injury uh, and you give them platelets, they actually have a higher mortality. 
which does not occur if you give DDAVP. Whether or not it improves outcome or not, I don't think the data is, is that good. And what is limiting the use of cold stored platelets now versus using them more later on? So something that you do not have, and that's the FDA. <laughs> well, and uh, so I don't know, um, what's the status in Canada? I leave that to, is Dana there? Yes, Dana's here. Yeah, so the status in Canada is that uh, Health Canada has not approved cold stored platelets. Uh, we may be joining a, a large clinical trial that Phil Spinella is organizing in the U.S. So Yes, so. yes, cardiac surgery. Yeah. Yeah, so they did it. So um, the, the first trial, and I think Phil was involved in this as well, was actually done in Norway. Uh, okay. Cardiac surgery. And yes, did Strandis to, and, and Apple. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, I, and it did seem to show a benefit. But I think that the key really here is um, I think you're looking at the potential for an improved product that can be stored longer. Interestingly, the FDA has approved cold store playlists for use in theater. So they have a, there's a special uh, excuse for use of cold store playlists in theater by the American uh, military, and it is being carried and utilized uh, and, and used out to about 20 days. So I think that so the FDA has approved cold stored platelets, but it's only for three days. Right. And it was done exactly. back in the late 1960s when we first developed component therapy. But the challenge is that you know they they've only given this exceptional approval for military use for 14 days, but not for yet for civilian medicine because there's just not enough clinical data to support the approval. Yeah, it's a, I think it's I think it's a really interesting uh, area. I think it's a really interesting area. Yeah. Any others? That was fabulous. Lots of thank you, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed. I, I've been monitoring the uh, the talks over the day as when I can, and I, they've been fascinating. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful. I wish I could have been there with you. We wish you could have been there too. We hope you uh, stay safe and a little more uh, quiet down there. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. All right, we're going to move on to our last speaker. Hong, are you are you driving or am I driving? Uh, I can drive. Sure. You wanna, do you want to share your screen then? Yeah, that would be easier. I'll yeah, it's always easier. Okay, in the meantime, I'll introduce you. Um, so Dr. Hong Shen Ma, or Hong, received his bachelor's degree in engineering physics at the University of British Columbia. He received a master's degree from the media lab at uh, MIT um, in Boston, and then a PhD in electrical engineering at MIT. Um, Hong is currently an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UBC. His lab, fortunately for us, situated within the CDR. His research focuses on the development of microfluidic technology to sort and analyze cells for the cancer, immunology, and blood storage. Hong, you're on. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me, and uh, really glad to um, really glad to be here. Um, so yeah, so uh, here today I'm going to be talking a little bit about our work to look at um, ways to measure quality of donated uh, uh, red blood cells. So, um, and I'm coming at this as an engineer, by the way, so you got to take what I say with plenty of salt as well. Um, so uh, as, as everyone knows, uh, red blood cell transfusion is one of the most common medical procedures uh, in the world, around the world. There's about 112 million donations collected each year. Uh, resulting in 85 million transfusions. And in the current, uh, the way that we currently treat the uh, donated blood is that after ABO typing, we essentially consider all unit to be, uh, to be identical, okay? That we don't dis uh, distinguish them or differentiate them in, 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 uh, in any way. And a longstanding question in the field has been, well, what are the differences between donors and units? I mean, you know, fundamentally, these are, these are cells are produced by different people and different, we know people are pretty different. So are there some differences between uh, the, the cells that are made by different people? And, and the related question to that is, what's a useful way to measure quality? Because if we had good ways to measure quality, then we could look at how we can improve our uh, storage practices. Uh, we could perhaps find ways to get the best unit to the best, um, uh, best patient. Uh, now, so the approaches for looking at this, uh, there's, I'll just talk about two sort of general schemes and then I'll highlight a couple of studies here. So one is to look at the storage time. Uh, so with the reasoning being that, well, the, the storage window is typically 42 days and 
the you know we know that the blood degrades over this time, so blood that's closer to the expiry date must be worse off than blood that's you know not that is freshly collected. And, and there's been a number of studies in, in, in this area, and um, they generally come to the similar conclusion. This is this one I'm highlighting here. It's a fairly large study uh, looking at differences between uh, blood that's been stored for uh, zero to seven days, eight to 35, and 35 to 42. And the conclusion was that, uh, you know, there, there was no, no, no statistically significant difference uh, being in hospital mortality rates. Uh, now, there's been always some criticisms of these studies in terms of, well, are you really balancing, you know, the, 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 each cohort, do they have the same uh, number of samples and things like that. And, and uh, uh, but this one, like most of the ones before it, did not show a, um, a, a major difference. Now, I'm really sorry I missed the, uh, the earlier talk, because uh, today is actually, there's an earlier talk today that's highly relevant, uh, but uh, today is the first day of virtual school at UBC, and I, I actually have to teach during that time. So, uh, so the other way to look at this uh, question is to say, well, maybe there are some broad, uh, you know, donor characteristics that would dis distinguish a different storage unit. So maybe, you know, donor age or donor, you know, or the sex of the donor. And there's been some studies as well in this area. And, um, and this one that, that I'm highlighting here, uh, interestingly enough, it actually showed uh, that there is a small difference um, uh, between donors who are, are that it's actually better to get uh, blood uh, from, mm -hmm. from older donors and younger donors, and it's better to get blood from men rather than, 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 than women. So older white men is, is or I mean, sorry, not, no, uh, Dre's not included here. Sorry, I just mean that older men is, is uh, potentially what you want to get your blood uh, uh, from. But, um, and, and, you know, and once again, you know, there's a lot of debate in terms of, you know, uh, you know what, what, how valid is this result, how, how um, uh, how big is that, is that effect? And one of the issues here is that, you know, even if you knew there was an effect, right? Even if you knew there was an effect, it's not really easily actionable, right? Like you cannot just eliminate, you know, half the donor pool or a significant fraction of the donor pool. That's just not, you know, we need, we need the donor pool, right? So, um, so how do we go forward? Well, I guess I would venture that maybe we should think about this question uh, in a, a little bit more, a little different way. And maybe we should think about it in terms of what exactly is that blood being used for? And so if you look at transfusion uh, recipients, I think you can broadly classify them into two groups. So one is, uh, one group is the acute blood loss group. So this is where somebody has, you know, it's because of trauma or surgery or childbirth, um, you know, they're, uh, there, there, you know, there's a blood loss, and you're just you're just put transfusing them to replace the the blood that they've lost, and then soon their their circulatory system can catch up, and, and and new blood is made. Okay, so here really we're looking to provide a benefit on the order of days, right? and 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 the sort of the appropriate measure of that benefit is just a hemoglobin uh, increment. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you also have the chronic patients, which uh, which you know has a you know so. Um, where they actually have a problem in generating red blood cells. And here you're transfusing them in order to provide them good red cells, uh, good red cells that you cannot you know, otherwise you know, generate, right? Um, and, and here, um, well, what we're trying to do is to provide a longer term benefit. And this is on the order of weeks, right? And, and the appropriate measure of that benefit, uh, I think is, is transfusion interval. It's really how long that transfusion lasts until you have to do another transfusion, because fundamentally, unless they address the underlying issue, uh, they will be continued to, to require transfusions. Right? And so if you really think about it this way, these are really two very different criteria, right? So one is on providing benefit on the order of days, and, and, and the other one is on the order of weeks. And so this allows us to ask a different question. And that question is, can the red blood cell circulation time be predicted? Because if we could predict the circulation time, then we could think about taking that, the pool of donors or the pool of units that we have and dividing them into two separate pools, one being the standard circulating unit and the other one being the longer circulating unit. So the standard circulating unit could go to the acute patients uh, because, they, uh, you know, because it seems like it doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter, it doesn't affect their outcome. Whereas the longer term circulation uh, units could be given to the chronic patients. And that would really benefit them because it would increase that transfusion interval, you know, and decrease a lot of morbidities like, you know, iron overload and things like that. Okay. So, so then we're trying to look at, you know, can we, can we predict 
this, um, this, um, the, this, the circulation time. Now, one of the ways in which uh, people have long thought about, you know, as a red, uh, biomarker for predicting circulation time is the red blood cell deformability. Uh, because as we know, red blood cells are, you know, they're like these eight micron discs. Discs are eight microns wide and about two microns wide. And they have to traverse the circulatory system every minute. So every single minute they go through the entire circulatory system. And as they do that traversal, they have to deform through all these tiny, tiny little holes, okay? And when they, when they do that, uh, they have to be very deformable. This is the reason the, the, why the, 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 the way that they're, they're made. And, um, and so the defor their deformability is really critical to their function. And, and we know that loss of deformability is part of the mechanism for clearing uh, you know, old or non-functional red cells uh, from the circulatory system. And, um, and what's interesting is that this, um, this uh, deformability change, this seems to be a irreversible process. Um, uh, I mean, we don't know for sure, but I mean, basically, I, you know, most, almost anything you do to the red cell, it would you know, cause it to become less deformable. Uh, usually very, uh, I, I don't, don't, I'm not aware of anything that makes, actually makes red cells more deformable. Um, so, and, and, uh, and, and here's our graphs from uh, that, uh, that our work that we did with our collaborator, Mark Scott, uh, where he uh, um, treated red blood cells with, uh, with different chemicals and that showed that that degraded deform deformability, but then it also led to a loss of circ uh, circulation time. So, um, so what we think is this is potentially a really good way to measure circulation time. Um, and um, so this is actually a long, uh, well-studied uh, well uh, topic uh, in, the, in the field of, in the area of biophysics and uh, more recently in, in the microfluidics. And so there's been many, many ways in which you can measure a red blood cell deformability. So starting from, um, you know, ectocytometry uh, to the filter-based methods like cell transit analyzer or individually using micropipettes um, or, or optical tweezers. We've done some of this work using different microfluidic structures to test individual cells. Um, other people have made artificial spleens or, or structures that look like spleens. And, uh, and a major challenge in this field is, is how do you make the measurement in a reproducible way? So most of these measurements you know, are, are, are good in the sense that they could, they could you know, if you use apparatus that day, you can measure some, you can measure, get some measure of red blood cell deformability and, and that would be consistent in that day. But the problem is if you come back like you know, a week later uh, using the same sample, uh, normally the same sample, can you, know, can you, do you get the same result? And, and that's, that reproducibility is a, is a, is a, is a difficult one. Uh, the other problem is throughput is that, you know, um, a lot of these methods, including some of our earlier work, is that you're measuring cells individually. So you're not getting a lot of measurements. And, and, and so it, it could be very easily uh, swayed by, you know, just incorrect sampling or sampling from the wrong, wrong area uh, because there are just so many red cells. So, so, we, uh, so we were looking at uh, some different ways to approach this. And sort of we started thinking about, okay, well, what's the problem with filtering cells? Okay, especially red blood cells. And it turns out, you know, the problem with filtering cells is that red blood cells are just really soft. So if you had a filter and you, you started capturing cells with it, you know, cells just kind of get stuck on the filter, you know, and it's very hard to, you know, it's hard to get them off. And, but also they plugged up the filter. So the filter kind of changes in an unpredictable way. And so, so we asked the question, well, is there a way that we can perpetually keep the filters clear? Okay, so we thought, okay, well, what if we had a slightly different microstructure? So imagine instead of the regular microstructure we had, imagine we had these pores and the pores are quite small. So they're like these funnel shapes and they're so small that you can push cells through in one direction, but if you try to push them back in the other direction, the structure of the microstructure makes it harder to push the cells back. So in this way, you know, you kind of have a difference between the force that's required to push the cell forward versus the force that's required to push the cell backwards. And then if you replicate this microstructure and you then put this in a, 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 a flow stream, you create this sort of oscillatory flow stream, what you can get is you can get the staircase pattern where the softer cells kind of go up here until they get to a point where they don't go through anymore and the more rigid cells are separate into the separate flow stream. So we can direct, we can create these sort of two separating flows 
um, that are then that are separate cells based on their their deformability, or more precisely, their ability to squeeze through, um, or they they could, uh, or their squeezeability. Okay, and the nice thing about this is that if we do it this way, um, we essentially keep the filters perpetually clear, and that means that we apply consistent filtration forces to all the cells, and that we get you know really nice sorting results. So here's what the device looks like. I mean, there's, uh, these things are very, very complicated in the end, but, um, uh, uh, but you can see over here, the fluid comes in through here, and this is the, the dark stuff is, is all, all the red cells, and they kind of sort of take this path through here. Once they're in there, they're kind of, kind of hard to see. Now, there should be a video here. Let's see. Oh, there's a video. Okay, so let me just show the video here. Um, so you can kind of see, so that's, you can follow the, the path of the red cells. And so there's this oscillatory back and forth flow to get them to try the different funnels. And you know, once they get to an area where they can't go, okay, now then they get they propagate outwards. And you know, most cells are fairly, um, you know, uh, are fairly soft, so they kind of go to the top and, and you filter them. Okay. So after we do go through this filtration process, then, let me see, why is my thing not advancing? Okay. So then we get this distribution. And as I showed you here, you know, most of the things are, are quite soft. So there's you know, all of these, these outlets here and, uh, and that are de depending on the size of the, of the pores. And um, depending on whether this, how you know, rigid or, or, uh, or, or deformable the population is, you sort of get a distribution in, in, this, um, in, in where, where the cells flow to. Um, and the way that they flow, well, it's, you know, so it's, it, it, so you get this distribution. Now it's a little bit hard to analyze this because, you know, you just get this distribution, you know, it's hard to compare distribution sometimes. So the way that we do that is we then make a, a cumulative distribution based on that. Uh, okay. So you end up getting a curve like this, and then you can draw this line across the 50 percentile. And we call that the rigidity score because that allows you to compare, okay, where does it cross over the 50 percentile? And we can sort of interpolate between the points here. So this is an example of a soft you know, red blood cell sample relative to a rigid red blood cell sample. Okay. And um, remember, you know, we talked about you know, earlier, the key thing is really the reproducibility. So here, you know, we test this extensively to say, okay, if we give the same sample, Okay, multiple times or multiple runs, you know, do we get the same distribution? And it seems like you know, we do get the same distribution. If we chemically degrade the sample, then we can, uh, you know, we can essentially shift this curve outwards. You know, it just depends on how much, uh, you know, how much of the, um, in this case, the glutar aldehyde we're using, very, very, very small amounts of it. Um, you know, how much of that fixation do you do? Okay, you can, you can make, that, make that change. Okay, so then, um, so then we can look at, okay, now if we look at donors and say, okay, well, how much variability is, is there? And from earlier studies, we knew that there was quite a bit of variability actually between these individuals in terms of how, how uh, soft or how rigid uh, the red cells are. And so we could, we could, you know, if we test a bunch of donors, you can see that they're distributed over uh, some distance. Now, if we pick the donors and we say, well, how repeatable is this to the donor? Okay, well, we do three samples, six weeks apart, we say, okay, the curves are pretty repeatable. Okay, maybe some little bit of change, you know, depending on slight changes in diet or whatever, or hormonal changes, but you know, it's pretty repeatable, uh, and it's specific to the donor. Okay, so that's that's interesting. But then, you know, the other thing we want to ask the question is, well, you know, does deformability imply stability? Because just because you have soft red blood cells when you, you know, when you donate. How does that change in, in the recipient? Like how, how does, you know, does, do you maintain that softness in the recipient or, or, does, or does it change, um, uh, or does it, you know, change right away? So we want to look at stability. And to do this, uh, we used uh, a, um, an accelerated aging model, okay? I mean, there, I think there, there's no real way to like age the red cells. So we just put in a test tube and put it in sadrum and leave it in the fridge and we test, we sample it every, every few days, okay? And interestingly, we can, you know, for each donor, we can get a series of curves like this. So a series of curves. And, and what's interesting is that the curves are look pretty different. Some donors start off really soft, but then they get more rigid very quickly. Whereas other donors um, almost don't change at all. I mean, they start off a little bit more rigid, but 
you know, they, um, they, they, they're pretty soft. Uh, they, I mean, sorry, they, they, they start, uh, they, they kind of stay that way. They don't change at all. So if we were to look at this, okay, this is just an, a summary plot of all those. You can kind of see there's some major differences between donors in terms of how well they store, how well they maintain. So we kind of want to ask the question, well, are there, you know, between the different donors, are there such thing as a poor store, like somebody who produces cells and doesn't store very well, uh, or doesn't la or isn't very stable? Or are there donors that are just highly stable, like super store? So here you see that like donor five and donor eight, you see that arrow is really tiny. So there's almost no change in 14 days of storage in, in, in non-optimal conditions, right? Accelerated aging. Whereas if you look at donor four and donor one, you know, Mass, massive change, right? And, and so, you know, it's not to say that like, you know, that, you know, that they couldn't, you know, the, the, the necessary, the, the, the red cell unit is bad. It's more that just maybe they're suited for better purposes. Maybe donor one and donor four are the ones that are better suited for the acute scenario, uh, you know, where, where, they, um, where the blood is um, used right away. And donor five and donor eight are, are better used for the chronic scenario where you want that you want the transfuse cells to last as long as possible, right? I mean, long ways to go to get there, but you know, this, this is the kind of questions that we can start asking. So uh, let me see, okay. So then uh, we also wanted to see, well, what's the consistency of those degradation curves? Meaning that if we tested them multiple times, so this is sample, say once again, six weeks apart, okay? And we follow that, you know, and we take that blood six weeks apart and we let it degrade, how much does that change? Well, it turns out it looked pretty consistent, right? That if you're a donor that has, you know, not a stable, less stable red cells, that changes very quickly. Whereas if you're a donor that give very consistent, you know, red cells, then they are very stable. So, I mean, this is, of course, this is small numbers here, right? So, you know, a few donors here, so we can't, you know, I don't want to make too, Broad generalizations here, but you know these are the kind of things that we can we can look at. Um, you know we did you know check the standard hematological parameters. There's no correlation between deformability that we measure and hematological parameters. Um, and then we, we're now starting to do some uh, um, studies in blood bags and looking at degradation in blood bags. And we knew this was going to be challenging because blood bags are just so good at preserving. Uh, you know, preserving red blood cells. And when we looked at blood bags where we store them for eight weeks, we sample them every week, we can see that, man, blood bags are good, right? That they're, they're that, you know, the, the blood bags are pretty good at, at keeping uh, the red cell deformability stable. Um, you know, once you get past six weeks, okay, then you see, okay, some of the donors are starting to, you know, starting to lose it pretty quickly, whereas uh, the other ones are, um, are, are continuing, okay? So, you know, we, we, uh, this is very preliminary. We, we got more samples as just the first six donors. We're going to do a lot more just to see how, how consistent uh, this is. Okay. Uh, but uh, at least what well, one is, you know, blood, it seems like blood bags are pretty, pretty good at this, uh, pretty good at their job. Okay. So, and then another thing, another interesting question we wanted to ask is that, well, you know, what's the, what's the relationship between blood bag versus segment? Because if we can sample from the segment, that sort of means we don't have to destroy the bag, right? So, so going forward, you know, it's, it's actually much easier to, um, to do studies that way. And interestingly, you know, uh, just as another point of comparison in terms of the stability of our measurement, the bags in the segment are a pretty good match. I mean, not exactly, right? Maybe things happen at slightly different time intervals, but overall, the characteristic you see in the bag is generally speaking, the characteristic you see in the segment. Okay. So that's uh, roughly where we're at. And uh, so I'm gonna sum up here. So basically we have this, developed this microfluidic ratchet mechanism to sort red blood cells based on deformability. And once we had this mechanism, we showed that red blood cell deformability is consistent to the donor. Okay, so if we pick the right donors, um, then we can get you know, softer red cells or, or more rigid red cells. Furthermore, red cell degradation curve is also consistent to the donor. So something intrinsic in those red cells, and this is done under our accelerated aging model, and we can argue about whether that's appropriate or not appropriate, but it does seem to be something that's consistent to the donor, okay? And, and maybe there's some studies we can do that we, down the road, we can figure out, okay, well, what exactly is making that? I think that's, a, that, you know, that's a, an interesting question. So ultimately, what, what I hope to get to is 
you know, could we use red blood cell deformability to predict circulation time? And, and if we could do it, then we have this great opportunity to, to, to think about separating the donor pools uh, and get appropriate bags for acute care and chronic care uh, patients. Um, and, uh, and, and that may, will essentially lead to better outcomes for chronic patients and uh, actually overall uh, better, more blood supply, right? Because you're giving less transfusion to chronic patients. Um, I just wanna also talk about a, a little, a couple upcoming studies we, we have that sort of are just continuing on from this, this, this thread. Um, so uh, one is this idea that, you know, so people know that if you lose the form, you know, that, that red cells are, um, are more rigid, do not circulate as long. Uh, but one thing that you know has always been a question in the field is, well, what is the actually the deformability of the cells that are cleared? Like, is it deformability that causes cells to get cleared? I think that question has never been answered firmly. So, one of the things we could do with this is we we can actually use our approach to answer that question. So we can actually transfuse in labeled cells that are uh, normal cells and put them into the mouse, and then we can see we can actually measure. Um, different, you know, the, the degradation, uh, the deformability of the cells that are remaining. So the cells that have been lost, and must be the cells that are clear so that we can actually measure the, deform, uh, uh, the deformability of the cells that are clear. So ultimately, so hopefully we can then draw a relationship between, okay, loss and deformability and rate of clearance. Okay. So let's say you lose your deformability by this much, then you, you increase your clearance by this much. Okay. Another thing uh, is that we've been doing a lot of these things um, with machine learning and my, my student uh, presented earlier about you know, using machine learning to measure deformability. And uh, surprisingly, you can actually look at the cells and get a pretty good sense of well, how uh, you know, deformable, how soft it is. Okay. And so that's really interesting. And uh, if we're leveraging off that capability, you know, ultimately I think the question we want to get to is, well, could we predict circulation time by looking? Right. Can we just look at the sample and say, hey, that's a long circulating unit or that's a short circulating unit? Can we, can we do that? Right. Um, anyways, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty promising. So, okay. So that's, uh, I want to leave it off there. And uh, yeah, and uh, thank you so much. Here's my group and all the funders. And uh, most of this work has been done by uh, Imel Ismail Azada and Eric uh, Lamarol and also Karen Matthews. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Han. That was great. That was excellent. Okay, um, can you turn off your sharing or de-share so we can let everybody else on? Okay. And we're open for questions, um, but while we're waiting for, so the, uh, the, the, the changes in deformability over time, those were really, and some, did, some didn't have any changes over the few days. Um, was that dependent at all on, on, I know it's small numbers, but was, was there any sex um, related um, factors involved there? Like were there women versus men, do you know? Yeah, so we, um, um, so actually we've been, you know, measuring red cell deformability for a long time in our lab. And that's sort of the general consensus is uh, women have uh, more deformable red cells than men. Um, and uh, marathon runners or elite athletes has more rigid red cells than uh, normal people. So, but, the change, but the change in during storage, like you showed the changes in storage of those same red blood cells, just because mm -hmm. you have deform, less deform, more deformability, does that turn, um, does that mean that the, that will be retained for a longer period of time? Yeah, we, we don't know. We, we have no idea. That. Yeah, and I don't think there's enough numbers to really say, to even guess at that. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Just wondering what affects the cell rigidity or deformability, physiologically speaking, or on a molecular level? Do you know that? Uh, that's a really complicated question. I mean, you got to do with you know the, the membrane proteins and the and the and the you know the all the all that good biochemistry going on there. Um, but uh, I, one thing I do know is I have not seen or found or heard of anything that makes cells softer. Okay, so everything is everything you do makes it more rigid. So it's interesting. I'm not sure if the, if it changes the deformability, but camels have ovalocytes. They have oval shaped red blood cells, um, and you know, so they travel through the circulation with obviously the long axis, um, and apparently that gives them the, the long axis isn't so different, I think, from the red human red blood cell. 
um, but it gives them more flexibility in terms of response to hydration. But I don't know if what it does in terms of deformability, but those will be ovalocytes. Now there are hereditary ovalocytosis and there are acquired causes of ovalocytosis in humans, so no idea what happens. Ed Prysdale, very cool. Could the filtration process affect cell function such as deformability? Yeah, we don't, we don't think so. I mean, uh, because physiologically the red cells deform, you know, so many times. I mean, they're, you know, each time around the circulatory system, they're deforming thousands of times. And then, you know, they're doing that every single minute. So um, I, I don't think the mechanical uh, compression uh, would cause them to have any kind of, um, you know, uh, non-elastic or the permanent, you know, would, would change them permanently. It's more the ch chemical processes that are driving that. Um, I mean, a long, long time ago, when I was a real doc, um, we used to do red cell half-lives in vivo in humans with, I think it was chromium labels um, yeah. in humans. Um, th I mean, that would be the only way, I guess, you have to label the red blood cells, infuse them, and then measure the deformability, say, at the beginning and at the end, and see what's ch if it's changed in vivo, what, what happens to the deformability that might be of interest. I don't think you'll get um, ethics approval to do those studies, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you can't do that anymore. I mean, I think what, um, I think there was a study uh, fairly recently with uh, biotinylating yeah, red cells. That one. Yeah, yeah. Pushing them out. Mark can help you on that one. Well, it's good to hear that the, I'm sure the Canadian Blood Service will be happy to hear that their bags are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, besides, I have a question, Ed. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, that's Don. I've got a question. Oh, oh, yeah, please. So, Hung, you know, we all know red cells are made to be deformable and we couldn't live without them. How much of this can you kind of translate over to nucleated cells from the blood that are much more complicated mechanically? They've got more control over their, I imagine, control over their, th their deformability, but I don't know if anybody really understands that. You looked at that side of it, things at all? Uh, we we did look at a little bit with uh, Mark Scott at, at some point, and um, you know, um, I, I think the physical uh, parameters are is there. There is it is a way to assay for certain uh, certain things with uh, leukocytes, uh, but it's just there's so much going on with leukocytes that I feel like the physical parameters is only is only one thing. Yeah, no, it's it's a horrible problem. I just wondered if there was any any progress there. Anyway, it's great stuff. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Another question, Hong. Um, how quick is the filtration process, and can it be scalable for general use in blood centers? Um, so you know, we we it it does take um it takes a couple of hours to do a test. Um, so you know, and we do that in the lab pretty regularly. Um, in terms of how scalable it is, I I would guess it's probably not that scalable. Um, although you could think about you know, testing individuals and identifying donors and sort of giving them a, you know, this, you're a high quality donor or long circulating donor versus a standard circulating donor. Uh, I think that that is possible. Uh, but, you know, certainly with further development, it, you know, it may, it may be made po more possible. But I don't think it's something you can do on every single bag at the production level. There was a question about the effects of either estrogen or testosterone on red cell deformability. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, no, we, you know, because we, we, we only, you know, we did lab donors and lab, friends of lab. And so it was very interesting that the runners uh, had, had more rigid red cells and we suspect they were clearing them much faster than the normal people. Um, but, you know, we haven't studied that to, that to any great extent, but I think it is really interesting. All right. I think we're done on that. Thanks very much, honey. That was fabulous. A great way to end the, uh, the program. Super. Thanks. That's excellent. Okay. So um, we're going to move on just to wrap up. I'm going to um, put a slide up and I'm going to call on, um, first I'm going to call on Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? I hope so. Yep, I'm here. All right, hold on a second. Hi, Stephanie. 
Okay, I'm going to just to put up a slide here. We just have a couple of things before people disappear to wherever. All right, Stephanie, it's all yours. Thanks, Saj. Um, so you've heard about the Twitter research showcase that we've kind of promoted throughout the symposium. Uh, just to give everybody some context, um, as a lead up to today's symposium, uh, the organizing team, which included myself and Christine Ho from the CBR, as well as Dr. Geraldine Walsh from the KD Blood Services, we hosted a new activity uh, yesterday called the Twitter Research Showcase where instead of poster presentations, uh, we challenged trainees to present their research project in a series of four to six tweets that are accessible to the, for the general public. And we hope everyone in the, here in the audience will take some time after the symposium to check out the showcase and engage with the trainees. Um, before we announce the winners, uh, Ed, can you go back to the first slide? Yes. Um, I'd like to thank our social media expert judges for engaging with our trainees and supporting their de professional development. Uh, Leanna, Christine, Kelly, and Christina, thank you very much. And I also want to thank Stem Cell Technologies and Science in the City for supporting our showcase and donating some prizes. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, the showcase wouldn't happen if we didn't have any participants. So a big thank you to our trainees for taking on this challenge. Um, it's definitely not easy to tweet about your research given the various limitations and restrictions of social media, but you've all done a great job. And we hope you had a great, had a lot of fun and found it to be a good opportunity for, uh, to develop your science communication skills. And with that, uh, the runner up for the showcase is Marie Soleil Smith. And the first place goes to Maria Elizabeth Deva. So congratulations to you both. Yeah. Uh, if I can find the reactions button, I would give you a virtual applause, but I can't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll contact you both afterwards about how to claim your prizes. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that wraps up the day. Dana, I'm gonna, well, let me just um, first um, thank everybody. Uh, first, so I don't forget actually, is to remind everybody to fill out the evaluations, which will be, you probably, you should have received electronically at the beginning, but you'll get them again, just to um, help us out um, in improving what is um, um, a challenge, needless to say, but uh, I think it was a fabulous day from my perspective. It was terrific to have, everybody involved, um, the speakers from all over the place and from uh, the participation, all the audience from all over the place and the great students um, organized, um, gave terrific presentations. Um, and many thanks obviously to, uh, to Mira, um, to um, Stephanie and Christine. Um, Dana, I'm gonna leave for you to make the final final. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for doing a much better job of sharing the second half than I did on the first, so you've got, got us back on time. And uh, just like to thank everybody for participating and bearing with us through our, our various uh, technical challenges here. I think uh, considering it's the first time we've tried to do one like this, it was, it was very successful. Lots of really interesting uh, data and uh, lots of things to think about and inspirational talks for coming up with other research ideas. So thank you everyone. And um, we'll let you uh, stand up now and get your circulation going again. So thanks very much. Thank you, thank you. Everybody stay safe. And we'll see you at the Earl Davy Symposium, November the 17th, same place, same station. The, the, the map password will be different. All right, everybody okay. well. Thanks, Dina. Take care. Great job. <laughs>